Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a good night's rest. We thank you for the, the safe traveling that and mercies that you've given to each person that's arrived here. And, and Lord, we ask that you would continue to give safe traveling mercies for, for those that are still coming later on in this week. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, bless each person here. And Father, I ask that you would guide my words, that the, that the in information would be presented uh, clearly and concisely, and that uh, we would answer any questions, and that, Lord, each one of us would learn to rely and trust more wholly on you and to be guided by your Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Country Living 101. Uh, the, the, one of the major, major themes of, of our camp out here for practical country living skills is uh, a transition from city dependence to dependence on the Lord. That's, that's sort of a, an overreaching theme, is depending on the Lord for everything. In city dependence, you know, the city defines where you live, where you sleep, where you eat, how you handle your food, your water, your waste, uh, sometimes whom you work with if you're living in, having to worship a, in a close area. Whereas with country, country living, we, we are training ourselves to have a greater reliance on God. We also, uh, the Lord ha has given us all sorts of blessings in the country to be, to be self-reliant. Not that we are self-reliant without God, but we are self-reliant and that we are able to, to handle our basic needs. So the Lord, is a, the Lord has supplied so many things to support us in the, in the country. So this seminar is really aimed to, at, to get you to answer the questions, how will I move to the country? What is it going to look like? Where am I going to go? And why am I going to get there? We sort of covered more of the why last night. So uh, it's not really intended to cover all of the subjects exhaustively, but it's mainly to get you to know what you don't know. I had an engineering prof in school, I, I, said, I mentioned this last night, and he said the difference between a good engineer and a bad engineer is a good engineer knows what he knows, and he knows what he doesn't know. A very bad engineer doesn't really know what he knows, and, he, and more importantly, doesn't know what he doesn't know. So, for those of you, how many, how many here are not currently living in the country? Any hands going up? I see a lot of hands, okay. So, the main purpose of this presentation is to get you to have a list of questions to ask, and also to make those questions appear less daunting, less fearful, uh, and, and for you to think about these things, that they're not as big as, and scary as they are. And another, another uh, avenue that I'm trying to get you to consider is that um, as you move to the country, we, we sometimes need help. We need the services of somebody. And, and there are times when there are people in the country who are, who are offering services that will take advantage over the ignorance of people in the city and will explain to you something that they tell you you need, and it's really, really expensive, and you'll go out and buy it. Um, a, an example that we have that actually is very recent is someone paying um, well over $10,000 for a water system. And, and um, that's an example of something that you don't necessarily need. And, uh, and so you can, be, you can be sold things by unscrupulous people. So we want to make sure that we move forward wisely and cautiously. So I'm, I'm giving you questions to ask. So that the main purpose of this presentation is, is to ask the questions, how, what, where, why? about country living. Country living 101. So there's a lot of subjects to cover, and we haven't got a lot of time, so I'm going to have to go rather, rather quickly. There's 78 slides to go through. So hopefully we can get that information in, and I will talk at a speed and rate that you'll understand. So we're going to cover water, uh, sources, treatment of water, uh, septic systems, sewage, outhouse, uh, considerations for power, whether it be utility, utility power like from the main lines or generator backup power or battery power. Um, and then, of course, uh, basic considerations for property, uh, which is some of these items are going to sort of have some crossover. As we go through some one subjects, they are interrelated. Uh, and then there's, whether you have a look at the lay of the land, make sure there's good drainage, you're not buying a swamp. Um, and then, of course, considerations for heat, and for your food security, and for income. So let's start off with water. In Isaiah 35, 33, verse 15 to 16, we read, He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppression, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high, his place shall, of defense shall be the munitions of rocks, his bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. 
So that's the text, I think, that speaks of water being sure. So water. It's probably one of the most important resources that we, that we need to live. You're not, you, can, you, can live, you can live without food for a period of time, but you can't live very long without water. Water is very important. So water in the city, it's often, uh, we, we turn on the tap, and there's generally complete confidence in the city of that water. The water is typically chlor- chlorinated. Uh, it's also often fluoridated. But, it, uh, but people have basic blind trust that the, what you drink out of the tap is safe. Uh, we know in Ontario we had that incident in Walkerton where a bunch of people got sick and died because the water treatment wasn't, wasn't uh, um, um, maintained properly. But in the country, the sources of water generally don't include city-treated water when you're looking at a country property. So that falls onto your own head, own head rather than... And you, so you basically are, are left with a, a choices for water of a well, the most common being a well. And with a well, there are drilled wells and there are dug wells. Uh, uh, the, back in the olden days, people would dig a hole, they suck water, and they would stop, and then that would be their water supply. Uh, most of the wells today are, uh, are drilled wells. But when you go to the country, finding country properties, you can find places that do have dug well. I know sitting here, we have a family that has, that has a dug well. And, uh, and so it's, it's not... Uh, it's not uh, Unusual. It's not unsanitary necessarily, but but you'll, we'll sort of go over some of the practices to make sure that your water is safe. Another source of water that you can find is a spring. Many people uh, aren't familiar with springs. There's not a lot of springs in Ontario, but there are sp- properties that have a spring, and a spring can be a very good source of water. And if it's properly developed, can be a good clean source of water. Uh, another source of water that people use sometimes is a cistern. A cistern being basically a large tank under the ground, and they can either collect rainwater, or you can actually pay, you can pay for a, a water truck to come fill it. When it comes to properties out in uh, British Columbia in the mountains, there's a lot of places where um, the neighbor may, some neighbor may have got a well, and he had to dig a thousand feet, and it cost him thirty thousand dollars to get a well in, in the mountains, or forty thousand dollars. And a lot of those people say, well. We'll just get a cistern because they can't afford that. A cistern is cheaper than doing a well. So there's there's places where they they have huge. They just go through rock and rock and rock and eventually they strike water. But um, that can be in, in BC. It can be an expense. In Ontario, we are blessed that we have typically water is available at a relatively low location, so you don't have to dig drill as deep. And to get an, uh, a, a reference for that, if you have neighbors, you can, uh, you can ask inquire at your neighbors. There are well records that you can find out how deep do they have to go to get water. And it's not always the case, but generally, the depth that your neighbors went to find water is about the depth you can expect to go water, to find, to find water as well. So, as I said, rainwater can be collected as a, as a source of water to drink. So let's just, we'll start off with well water. So, as I said, there's two basic types of, of wells, a dug well and a drilled well. And a properly constructed well has got some very important features. It's got protection of the uh, well at the surface, uh, and it's got um, protection under the surface. So the the safety that was inquired, the protection at the surface, prevents uh, the inflow of surface water. And the main thing we're worried typically about surface water is basically fecal content. So... um, You've got your, your rodents, or if you're on a farm, you've got cattle, and you don't want to have any of the sewage making it in from the surface into your well. The next thing you need is protection under the surface. Sometimes you could have a, you could have a well, and under the surface, if you've got very well aerated soil, in other words, it's, it's, it's like a sponge, then the, water, the, 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 the um, surface water essentially can filter through that and get into your well right away. So you need that kind of protection. So that's one of the most important things um, and then, of course, you, may, you need, may need protection under the, below the surface uh, as well, below your well, in that you need uh, a, a good soil base that sometimes when you have, uh, you may have a very loose, loose water um, soil structure around your well, potentially, like, for example, you had a gravel pit next door, for example, just picking something. Um, you could get uh, sideways infiltration. But generally, what we're looking for is a, is a minimum distance to that sort, of, that sort of item. I'll show you some very simple ways that water is filtered in third world countries, and it'll give you an idea of, um, of the amount of filtration that's actually required. So we have dug well and drilled well. And with the drilled well, as we can see here, there's an example here that it's got, cl- there's clay at the surface, and there's sort of sand found under the soil, and then and it, it shows like a water line. And there's protection above the surface with the little house he's got there. 
uh, and he's also got protection at the base, where he's got uh, um, a little structure that will prevent inflow of water. This is, a, this is a, a traditional drug well. And the next thing that we need to concern ourselves with is quality. So uh, the, the quality basically is tied up with all that filtration. Now, in third world countries, filtration can be done rather simply. You can see here, there's a, there's a picture of a lady in Bangladesh, and she's using a very simple water filter. It simply amount, amounts to uh, a little concrete box that's built inexpensively. They've got a, you can see there, that little plate at the top is a, they, they pour in contaminated water. You can see that in the slide there, there's some, what looks like brown, nasty water you probably wouldn't want to be drinking. And then on one hand, and then clear water on the other side. So the way the water flows through, it's, it's really simple. He's got like a little diffusion plate, which is essentially a steel plate with a bunch of holes in it. Um, and then there's uh, what forms on the top of this sand layer is a biologically active, like a biofilm. Essentially, it's sort of like scum. And the, that, that creates a thick filter area. And the, the water silt seeps through the sand. There's a little bit of a gravel mesh, and then it goes through concrete in the body. So there's a short level of sand here that goes through. And then the water comes up through the, through the side, out the spout, and you just turn on the spout, and you get clean water out. So it's really, really simple. And the amount of actual filter, filtration you need is not very much. But a key element of this, of this uh, filter here is that it is protected from the sides. So you can see that all the, from the, when the water enters the top till the water leaves the spout, there is no opportunity for contamination to enter in. It's very, very simple. So the key principle that this, this kind of captures, this natural filtration, is that you basically need pr um, protection from your water. Now, um, be once you start drilling into the ground, we don't have concrete sides around our sources of water flow generally. Sometimes we're, there's places where you get property and it's on like a limestone bed. And um, sometimes in the cracks of the limestone, essentially you have a wide open pipe between the, the limestone. And so water can come in freely. And so we have to monitor our water to make sure that it's, it's safe. Just giving you a sort of a, an illustration of, uh, of a water table and how we can protect from contamination, you can see it, it, we have an example of basically a skin of soil over the, over the ground, and there's a water table that is found below the soil. And so the sources of contamination could, can be like industrial. So one of the things to be concerned about is you generally don't want to be downstream from some sort of chemical plant. Um, you, don't, you don't want to be downstream from, from something like a, a highly, with a high lot of fertili fertilizers coming into the area. So uh, there's manure that can get to the ground. If you, if you have a, a dairy farm right next door, you would want to make sure that your water is tested very regularly. It, it's, not it's, not, it's not necessary that if you're next to one of these things that you're going to have contaminated soil, but it's something you need to monitor too because depending on how um, loose your aquifer is, if your aquifer has got a good soil level between there, kind of like in that illustration we showed on the previous slide, then it's fine. But if you had a very loose um, soil structure, then, th then you could be getting less filtered water. And so the general principle is the farther you are from sources of contamination, the better you are, because it's eventually going through layers of dirt. So it's not to say that you can't live next to a dairy farm, because there's probably country properties that are right next to a dairy farm that's just fine because there's, there's adequate filtration in the soil. But it's something that you, want, that you want to remind yourself that you need to check the quality of your ground, of your water, sorry. So, uh, in fact, with, it brings up another point, is when, when people are constructing a farm, so often what you'll find in a country, live, a prop, country living property is a farm that's been abandoned. Now, when farms were constructed way back when, Farmer Joe decided, I want my barn there, I want my house there, I want my well here, and my septic tanks over there. And there was no plan for where manure is going to be, water is going to be, and sewage is going to be. So nowadays, when a farm is constructed, there's a formula called the minimum separation distance, which talks about having the minimum distance from manure to water tables. So any modern constructed farm has to comply to all of these regulations so that there is at least a minimum distance for, for uh, that natural filtration process to happen. They actually have to have a manure management plan put in place to manage, to, to manage where the manure is going to be. So a modern constructed farm has got some safeguards in there, in, in place. So, but when you're buying a, um, a country living property, it may not have had those items in place. And uh, as long as you're not adding new, if you're not planning to get a bunch of cows and stuff that are close to your well, you may not have to worry about that. But one of the items as well shown here is that there's that uh, the well cap and casing. You know, when you look at the well cap and casing around the well, you want to make sure that it is solid 
and no leak sources. There's a minimum distance that you have to have filtration, um, or it's not filtration, but protection. So generally it's a steel cap and it sticks into the ground. I believe it's uh, eight, six feet. Um, and so there's, it's a sealed cap. If you see cracks on your steel uh, in, a, in a pipe that you're, of a property you're considering purchasing, you might want to get that changed because there's possible possibility of, of groundwater seeping through that pipe into your well. So um, another item is you can see on this well here, uh, there's a, a little hole at the side. Typically, uh, the exit port for your pipe, the, a, a pump is put down to the ground, and there's a, a little, just to explain how it works, there's a little fitting on the end of a stick, and it has an O-ring around the side, and it basically goes into a coupler and goes clunk, and it seals against that side, and it comes out the side of the pipe. You can see an illustration there, and that goes to your house. And so anywhere, but anywhere between, anywhere where the water goes, you want to make sure that you have a good, clean seal the whole direction. Okay, so the checklist you want to look for, do you have uphill contamination sources for your property? Uh, is the grade around your uh, well casing such that the water will drain away from the well casing? Uh, and do you have good distances from contamination? And you want to check the general well casing condition. So in terms of protection, there's some separation distances, basic rules of thumb here for, for separation distances. If you've got an earth privy pit, um, so, for example, over here we've got some we've got uh, outhouses. You want to be uh, 50 feet at least. That's uh, 15 meters away from a, uh, a watertight well casing, which is watertight to a depth of six meters. That's 19.7 feet. So the well casing in this for this diagram from the, this is a regulation from Ontario, uh, Canada. You can see the the link at the bottom of the page there is Ontario.ca slash page, technical bulletins, well regulations, setting a new well. And uh, if you have uh, any other well, such as a, a well like a spring or a well that doesn't have a, a watertight casing, then it's recommended that you be 100 feet from, uh, from those types of sources of contamination. Uh, so if you have a privy vault or a pale, pale privy, you can be as close as 33 feet. So a, a privy vault, just so you know, that's a, basically an outhouse that's got like a, a concrete box or a or a, um, a watertight box. So, uh, so those boxes generally can leak a little bit, but, but um, it's, the main waste is, in, is contained in the privy box. Um, if you have a gray water system, you can be 33 feet from them. If you have a cesspool, uh, it's really uncommon for people to have cesspools, but there are cesspools around. A cesspool is essentially a pond where your raw sewage is pumped into. It's, um, I know at the, at the, at the Camp Frenda they have a cesspool where the, the sewage from the upper cabins is pumped to a, to a cesspool. It's, it's almost, uh, you're almost never going to come across a cess, cesspool. And then from treatment units, such a most, most common here would be a septic system. If you're going to have a well, you need to be uh, 50 feet at least, 50 meters from a sealed well casing, or 100 from what, something that's not as sealed. So when you're looking for a property, it may well be that the distance from the well that was built, if it's an older property and there's an existing septic system, it potentially could be closer than 50 feet. So if, but if it's uh, not a protected well, then it needs to be 100 feet. So it's just something to be, be cautious of that you need to have uh, a good distance between uh, contamination sources. And then there's a distance there for holding tanks. It's also, uh, a holding tank is also uh, recommended to be 50 feet. And a holding tank, just for those of you who don't know, if, if you can't afford a septic system, you can simply get basically what amounts to a large tank buried underground that your waste is pumped into and then periodically get that pumped out. That's a, another option for handling your waste. Okay, so water testing and water and uh, well treatment. Uh, in pub the Public Health of Ontario supplies free water, te water testing services. Uh, and it's, it's a reality that most homeowners will uh, pretty much establish that they have a safe well and often they'll just stop testing. But it's important once you get a well and you initially move to the country that you are very familiar with the safety of your well. And what can change the safety of your well? Well, if you have, like this year, we've got an awful lot of rain. So because we have an awful lot of rain, there is generally more influx of surface water down to the water table. And so it's important to check the quality of your well. So this year, even if you've been a complacent owner that hasn't been testing your water regularly, um, this year would be a good year to retest your well, your water. Uh, so with regular testing, 
Occasionally, a homeowner may find that, for example, in the spring or in the fall, when there's a lot of water, water um, running, there may be a problem with the well and that there could be some bacteria in the well. And uh, sometimes with the wells that I've had, for example, there's been problems in the spring or fall, and we would simply shock the well, which amounts to basically pouring the correct amount of bleach down the well, uh, running it through your pipes and letting it sit for a few hours, and, and then draining the rest out of a garden hose so it doesn't go into my septic system. And over that, over that course of period, then that has gotten rid of the bacteria. My peak hump of the, of the influx of, of surface water has passed, and the well is, is tested again and comes up safe. So um, little treatments that, that, that you have to be aware of, and you can only be aware of those sort of problems if you get your water tested. So the Ontario Public Health offers some advice. What they test for? They test for coliform and E. coli. So these bacteria are often found in animal waste, coliform, and sewage, and soil vegetation. And if they are in your drinking water, it means that the surface water could be entering your well if there's coliform in there. So that's an indication that, uh, of, of a test. It's a free test that can let you know you might need to do something about the protection of your well. Uh, for example, the casing could be a problem. It could be a crack or somewhere underground. Um, then, of course, E. coli. These bacteria are normally found only in the digestive systems of people and animals. And if they're in your drinking water, it usually means that animal or human waste is entering your well from a nearby source. So those are the only two things that they test for. So uh, I, I gave a brief example of um, contamination from um, uh, factories and what, what not around there. Well, just to give you a brief illustration, our church recently considered, locally in, in the Madoc area, recently considered purchasing uh, a property just off Highway 7, there's a little, nice little, uh, used to be a Chinese restaurant there, and then it was an antique store, and it was sitting vacant for a long time. And we were praying for the Lord to guide us to buy that, to, to, if it was his will, to buy that property. And we did not do any water testing or anything like that, and we prayed that the Lord would guide and lead, and someone bought it out from under us as we were making steps to move there. And it turns out that it is downstream from the, um, one of the Madoc mines, and the water table is contaminated with asbestos. So the Lord saved us from that property. So um, the, the point I'm, gonna get, I'm making here is that your free water testing does not test for asbestos. That's, that's the point I'm getting at here. So if you're, if you're going to an area, you might want to ask, are there any mines around? And you can, you can pay for, that's a test that's not free. You'd have to pay for that. So. Um, the Lord blessed us in that, way, in that regards. We had many people praying, and there's, you know, in the, the, the prayers of, of, the, of the saints of Ailes Month. So, so my point being is that you might, might want to consider um, what has been the activity upstream from your area. Because when they, when they mine things like um, gold and um, things like that, they use uh, chemicals such as arsenic. There's all kinds of chemicals that are used. So... Um, if it costs you $100 to get a well tested, and you're considering investing half a lifetime savings in a property, I think $100 is fairly inexpensive. Even if it was $200, you, 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 to, to save you from, from spending your life savings on a property, test the water if you're going to buy a property in the middle of nowhere. Okay. So uh, public health has some minimum recommendations for uh, duration of testing. It's... it's uh, quite simple process. They, they recommend three tests per year and to do those tests during the largest water flows. And they recommend you test during the spring, during the summer, and during the fall. And if you have a, time, a period where there's more precipitation, more water, then it's recommended that you test more frequently. I have a, a very brief five-minute video that comes from Ontario Health to give explanations on how you do the water testing. It's a very simple process. Um, and I'll, I'll just briefly explain one aspect they described in there is when you do your tests, you know, most of your taps have got those little bubbly aerators. Well, the bubbly aerators are great. They give you a nice, smooth feeling for the water and it flows great. But those items can be a uh, container for um, just enough bacteria from the air to get into the water so that when that water sits long enough that it can make the test a false negative. In other words, you may have something sitting on the counter and, the, and enough bacteria in the air that goes through your water system that um, for you to drink it's not going to harm you at all, but by the time it sits in a bottle long enough, it could make the bottle give a false negative. So they recommend that you take the, any of the aerators off. Uh, if you've got a t an area where you don't have any aerator, such as typically a bathtub doesn't, that's probably a better place to, to, to collect your water. 
but um, you need to be really clean practices because there's, there are um, simple bacteria that are around on our countertops, which we're used to handling our system and it doesn't cause us problems. But if you enter it into a test bottle, it can give you a false negative. So I'll just play this short video for you. Hopefully you can hear. Uh, maybe I'll take my headset off and put it near my speaker here um, so you can see this thing. Water. It's a precious resource, one that all life depends on. Clean drinking water is essential, so it's important, especially for those who get their water from wells, to make sure their water is clean and safe to drink. Water may contain many microorganisms like E. coli and Campylobacter that can make you sick. These microorganisms can give you stomach cramps or diarrhea and in some cases can be life-threatening. Frequent sampling of your drinking water will allow you to determine the bacteriological quality of your water supply. Monitoring your well water is important because water quality can change, especially during periods of heavy rainfall. It is recommended that you sample your well water at least three times per year, during or immediately following the spring melt, midsummer and fall. There are a number of steps to follow to ensure successful collection of a sample. The first step is to obtain a proper water sample bottle from the public health laboratory, your local public health unit, or one of the designated pickup locations in your area. Only water collected in these containers will be accepted at the public health laboratory. Sample your well water when you're sure it can be delivered to the public health unit or designated drop-off location within 24 hours. Your water sample shouldn't be left sitting for a long period of time as this can lead to inaccurate test results. Wash your hands before taking your water sample. When you take a water sample, it's important to make sure it is truly representative of your water supply. Remove any equipment or attachments such as aerators or filters from your tap. Don't take your sample from an outside faucet or garden hose. Always take a sample from an indoor tap with no aerator. A bathtub faucet is a good example. Disinfect the end of the faucet to remove debris or bacteria before collecting your sample. Use an alcohol swab or a diluted bleach solution made by mixing a quarter teaspoon of household unscented bleach in a glass of water. Turn on the cold water tap and let it run for two to three minutes. This should be enough time to remove standing water from the plumbing system. Reduce the water flow to a steady, slow water stream to avoid excessive splashing when filling the sample bottle. Remove the sample bottle lid, but be sure not to touch the inside of the lid. Do not put the lid down or rinse the bottle. Fill the bottle to the level that is clearly marked on the container and close the lid firmly. Filling out the information form that accompanies each sample is important for tracking your results. If the required fields in the form are not filled out, your sample may not be tested. Write down the barcode number on the small pink form. This is your reference number. Write your name on the small peel-off tab and stick it to the back of the bottle. Insert the completed information in the plastic sleeve and wrap it around the bottle. Your sample is now ready for submission. Keep the sample cool until it is delivered to the drop-off location. Deliver the sample within 24 hours or it may not be processed. Remember, proper handling leads to accurate test results. Again, the steps are Obtain a proper water sampling bottle. Sample your water when it can be delivered within 24 hours. Always sample from an indoor tap with no aerator. Wash your hands before taking a sample. Disinfect the tap to remove bacteria and debris. Run water for two to three minutes before sampling. Fill the bottle to the level that is clearly marked on the container. Fill out all of the required paperwork and keep the sample cool and deliver within 24 hours. Frequent accurate water sampling can help prevent the serious illnesses associated with poor water quality. Protect yourself and your family by protecting your source water supply.
Okay. It's quite a simple process to test your water, and it's a process that you need to follow regularly to be to make sure that you have um, safe, healthy water. It's a process that, to be perfectly honest, there are many people that have a well that that uh, they've drank at for generations, and they never test. So at, I'll be being perfectly honest that a lot of people just don't test. They may they test and then they might do something to just fix the problem. Um, for example, I myself, uh, I, I live in a place where there is essentially a dug well, and we were told it didn't, it would not pass. Uh, and I knew it would not pass all throughout the year, and so we installed a system that was very simple, just to, to handle the the bacteria coliform a filter system, and then we, t we tested the filter system water, and it passed. And so because I don't, I, we're, we're currently at a, at a location where we're actually, we're renting a place, um, and I had no intention of paying to fix someone else's system s to make sure that there was no problem with it at all. So I simply uh, fixed the water that I was going to drink, and didn't worry about the rest of the system. And that may be uh, an approach that's possible. But if you own a system, it's important that you just make sure that what you're drinking is safe. So this is a simple process to, to follow. So the, the form there is it's quite simple. It's a basic form that you fill out. You put your name, you stick a sticker on the, on the bottle, um, and you're going to get a result. And what does your result say? Well, your result will say that there is no significant evidence of bacterial contamination. There is significant evidence of bacterial contamination. And they'll give you, if there is, they'll give you percentage numbers. And it'll say it's either unsafe to drink because of evidence of fecal contamination, or uh, they'll give those two odd ones, which basically meant that you messed up your sampling process. No data, overgrown with non-target or overgrown with target. So um, that, those two last ones essentially mean that you either um, collected dirty water or, or uh, your sample was so foul that they didn't accept it as a real test. You must have messed up. So, or done one of the things they told you not to do, like touch the lid or something. Something happened that it's clearly um, your result is, is not good. So now what? So if you have no significant evidence of bacterial contamination, contamination it means that uh, there was a colony forming units of, uh, of per 100 millimeters, uh, is no, that's either no significant bacterial contamination was found, and they, the, the total coliform form is five or less. So what to do? If you have zero E. coli, you, the tests, you can continue um, to test your drinking water on a regular basis to see if there's any changes in your water. So if you have a, a no problems in your water, you're, you're probably okay to the next test. But if you've got, um, if you've got uh, some, you want to continue testing. So if you've got significant evidence, uh, you've got a colony forming per 100 mLs is more than 5, but zero E. coli. It says significant bacterial contamination was found. You should stop using your well water to drink untreated. Um, you want me to contact your local um, health unit and consider using either bottled water, water for the time period, or, or you would want to um, filter and test your water. If you've got unsafe to drink water, it means that you've got to stop right away. You may have some E. coli in your water. That's, that's one of the reasons there for it to be considered unsafe is you have E. coli. And E. coli can be very, very um, uh, hard on your, on you, on your health, can be life-threatening. So it's unsafe to drink. You need to contact your health unit. They'll give you advice, which might be, for example, if, if, it's, if coliform could have gotten in your well, for example, there was a hole in your well and uh, some rodent got in there and fell into your water. It could be something simple. That, that you can actually fix relatively easily. Um, it may be something that you can clean out or some bleach will solve, but um, it requires further investigation. It's sort of an unknown what the source is. But if you can determine the source and if you find a hole near the well, it's something that you can, um, you can patch and repair. So quality of water. There's all kinds of filter systems. We're going to start off with a, uh, just going over some filter systems that you can get for over, above counter water, above counter filters. Um, so shown here are Berkey water filter systems. Berkey water filter systems are just an example of above, above water filters. Uh, they, they basically amount to a pot that has holes in the bottom that's got filters that are screwed into those holes and the water drips out. Um, I was in Guyana and we, they had uh, uh, Berkey water systems on the counter and they st stuck in contaminated water in the top and clean drink, drinking water comes out, it, like right from the, right from the, the river. Um, so it's a very, very simple, simple system. They are um, relatively inexpensive. You can see that, that they've got the, the big Berkey there at the, at the end there, which goes up to $600. And you can see there's little circles in those smaller dots. Each of those circles represents a location where you can stick a filter. So you could actually get the biggest one 
and only install one filter if you wanted, but that wouldn't necessarily make sense. It just, just means that you would fill water and you have to wait a long time. The more filters you stick in there, the faster the water will come through. Um, so that's a very relatively, it's, they're, they're not super cheap, but if, all your, if your only source of water was contaminated water, um, this is a way to turn contaminated water into clean water in a relatively uh, low cost, easy to maintain way. Uh, about under the counter systems, this is the type of system actually that I installed. Uh, the one on the right there, 159, it's something I got at Home Hardware. Um, it's a relatively simple system. They've got uh, a carbon filter which filters out uh, certain chemicals. Uh, and the one that was of primary concern is the one to the, to the left there is a ceramic filter. And that filters out uh, uh, E. coli coliform. So, uh, it's got 99.9% 9 .9 of bacteria um, filtration. And the, the ceramic filter, for, in terms of maintenance, it essentially, the, what you get there is, uh, is um, uh, a scum that forms on the outside of the surface over time, and it'll slowly produce less water. And you simply take a little bit of sand. Well, we ju I just washed it off by hand, and you take a little sandpaper to it to, uh, that they get, comes in the kit for you to uh, scrub off the scum on the outside. And then there's a little measuring gauge to make sure that the thickness is a proper thickness. As long as you've got enough thickness left behind, you can keep using your filter. And I think those filters are like 30 bucks. I replaced it once so far, and um, it's, it lasted probably a year and a half. So that's, that, was, that was my system, and, and I tested the water at the backside of that filter. Then, of course, there are reverse osmosis systems. The diff one of the main differences between reverse osmosis systems and, and like a simple ceramic charcoal filter is reverse osmosis systems, you see that little white canister to the end. Essentially, it filters a batch of water at a time. It's kind of like a pot of water. Uh, and the, the most common complaint I've heard from people that have a reverse osmosis system, they love the taste of the water, but they'll run out of water and they have to wait for it to filter because it's very slow. Whereas the ceramic one is pretty quick. So um, there, if, if you have taste issues with your well, like maybe you have a lot of iron in your water or something, you might want to go to reverse osmosis, but just be aware that that uh, the size of your of your of your uh, your tank sort of you have little batches of water. So um, sometimes we tend to use no water throughout the day, and suddenly you want three gallons, and then no water. A question? What about sulfur water? There are there are yeah there are ways to filter sulfur water. Um, Maybe I should talk to you after that. Maybe I'll talk to you briefly about that in the next one, because I'll, I'll go through this. In the next one, we have, um, there are whole health systems. So I'm guessing you have sulfur water. So um, in a whole, a whole health system, they, they have what's known as a, a UV system. And so ultraviolet system, what does an ultraviolet system do? Uh, essentially, an ultraviolet system sterilizes the bacteria through there. So it doesn't necessarily remove it. So the problem with E. coli, for example, is that it gets into your gut, and, it, and it's not sterile, that means, so it, it can reproduce and duplicate. So it'll reproduce, 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 and then you get sick. So a UV system, um, it has an ultraviolet light, which shines on the, um, the water, and periodically you have to check the bulb, and, and uh, most systems will have like a little buzzer that'll go beee, to let you know that the, the bulb is dead. You periodically replace the bulb, so it sterilizes any of the, any any uh, periodic bacteria, so that uh, once it gets into your gut, uh, it doesn't duplicate and and, and cause you uh, illness. Uh, and then, of course, they've got two stages of filter, which you can um, you can choose a variety of filter options for those, such as uh, activated car carbon. And then there are uh, three-stage systems there: UV softener waters. So I'll get briefly into. Um, Sulfur, because it, sulfur, the question was asked. So uh, sometimes when you have a well, I'll, I'll just give a brief testimony. We had we had a well, and um, there are there are times when wells produce lower amounts of water. And in general, for a well, they they say some actually, some banks actually have a requirement for the amount of water that your well produces. And I I have to speak off the top of my head, but I I think it's something in the range of two and a half gallons per minute is what they want as a minimum for a household. Uh, however, I had a well that had about 1.8 gallons per minute. Um, but I was OK with that because it, it was uh, a, a well that was 100 feet deep. And it went, uh, it had a static water level of about 4 feet. So I'll have to explain the terminology there. Um, so if my well goes down 100 feet and I hit water, the water may come and fill up my well 
and say I want 100 feet down, if it comes up to 50 feet, that means the static water level is 50 feet. So my static water level was like uh, 8 feet or something like that. It was pretty much at the surface. And in the spring, it would keep flowing out <laughs> So at the well that I had previously. Um, and so I, I had actually, I saw an advertisement, and it said, free, free uh, uh, water frack, fracking. And uh, they have no charge unless we improve your water. So I thought, well, we were wanting to use the water for uh, gardening purposes, which is generally not a good idea. Um, and so I thought, well, it's not going to cost me anything, and at the best, it'll cost me $3,500. So I thought, oh, I think that was the price. So I was going to pay for water fracking. Water fracking is a process that they use in, um, oh, they're all in gas fields. Basically, what they do is they stick a pipe down, and they, uh, they'll inflate a, a bellows in the bottom and a bellows on the top, and then they will pump very high-pressure water there. And the idea is that it will crack the walks and open up the fissures and maybe clean them out. They'll pump in a whole bunch of water. And then once it's all cleaned out, you'll get better water flow. So they did that at my well, and they didn't get any better water, but they struck sulfur, <laughs> which is what you're, you're alluding to. And so I, I had a, a, a well which had no improvement, no cost for my service, but I got free sulfur. <laughs> so... Uh, um, so uh, I am an engineer, so I, I did some searching in line, and I, in fact, I found a very simple patent online of how to filter sulfur out of your water. And um, I, I looked at the system, and in, I, in fact, I found a system that a friend had actually installed in their house. Um, but after, I figured out what to do. And um, essentially, uh, the commercial system was in the range of five to $7,000 um, to, to handle sulfur from your well. But essentially, getting sulfur out of your well, all you need is charcoal and air. Um, so what I, what I did is I, I looked online, and I found an old water softener system that someone was getting rid of that they, they didn't want anymore, uh, because sometimes people get a new one because they don't like the old one. And so I, I bought that for, I think it was $50, um, maybe 100 I can't remember. Anyhow, I unscrewed the top, and I dumped out inside there's a bunch of little plastic beads, which are, get coated with salt which helped to uh, soften your water. So I dumped all the plastic beads, threw them all out, and I filled it with um, what's known as GAC, granulated activated carbon. It's basically like a bag of little rocks of, gra of, of carbon. You dump that into your, tr your, your charcoal filter, in into the, the water softener, and the water softener has a little pipe down the bottom so that the water enters the top and uh, it goes through the, through the GAC. So the, the water goes down the pipe to the bottom and comes back up through the, through the granule activated carbon. And then to get air in there, there's little, like a thir around, around a $35, 40 actually I think it was $100, $100 little um, venturi meter. It's just a little fitting that sucks air in when water flows. So when a pump turns on, it sucks the little bubbles into the air, into the water, and goes through the GAC filter, and it filters out the charcoal. That's essentially what the system is, but you can buy commercial ones which solve the problem, but I, it cost me like $300 or something like that for the parts, plus all the cost of the fittings, which is probably triple the cost of the parts um, to, to connect it. So you can filter salt, sulfur out of the water, um, but sulfur is very, it's a little difficult because uh, just a tiny bit of sulfur and you smell rotten eggs, which is probably, that, that's your experience. Yeah, so, but you, yeah, and, and many people think it's good for you. So uh, if you can endure the smell, the only time it's tough is, is, is having a shower. Hot water, hot sulfur water doesn't smell very good. It's probably the worst. We had a sand point. Oh, sand? Sand, sand point well. Okay, through, down through the sand. Yeah. It was, it was at a cottage area, and it was all sand. Yeah. So, yeah. The, 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 you can experience problems like that. So just so you know, sulfur, filtering sulfur out of your water is one of the more difficult things to do. Um, so quality water disinfecting a well. So um, I alluded to this sort of uh, this talk here. If you have contamination in your well f from ground source water, uh, it can be disinfected by a simple process. Uh, there's little calculators online for calculating the amount of, uh, water, of uh, chlorine required. So if you have a dug well that's very large, you're going to require more chlorine. And if you have a, a drilled well, um, and you, know your, you have to know your static water level. So the total, length of, the total amount of water, and um, you add the appropriate amount of, of chlorine there. So it's a little calculator online. Um, you're basically looking for uh, some information that you should get from a well report. If you ever buy a property, you should pay for a well report. They're, they're, they're stored by the uh, Ministry of Ontario for all wells that are, that are drilled. If you get an older property, you may not have a well report. Um, so, but 
most properties that are built since around 1960 have a well report on record that, how, that tells you how deep the well was, uh, the type of soil you drilled through that they drilled through, and um, when they, what, at what depth they struck the water, and then at what height is the static water level. You should have all that information on a well report. So that information can be used to calculate how much chlorine you need uh, for the minimum. The simple solution sometimes is just to go double. <laughs> just being honest. <laughs> Rather than calculate it, just put way more than you need. But um, if, if you want to have put the minimum, because uh, then you would, you would use the, uh, the recommended procedure there. It's, it's, uh, it's not difficult to get the appropriate amount to disinfect a well. So basically what, what happens is your, your well cap is opened. Uh, you have a cup of your bleach mixture. You dump it into the well. You wait for about a uh, half hour for it to s diffuse through the, through the well. Um, and then you bring the, the chlorine water into all the pipes of your home because everywhere water went that was contaminated, you could have bacteria. So for example, if you have a sink in the bathroom upstairs, you turn it on there slowly and you smell. When you smell bleach, you shut it off. You go around every tap in the house, you do the same procedure. For when you, until you smell bleach, you shut it off, um, both for hot and cold water. Um, and then uh, it's, you let it sit in the pipes of your home, so you're disinfecting both the pipes of your home and down in the well. Uh, and then uh, after it's sat there for uh, a couple hours, then you typically drain your system. And ideally, you try, and, you try and limit the amount of bleach that you put into your, into your, uh, your septic system, and so uh, you would pour that water out to the... Um, out with a hose out, out, out on your garden. Okay, so uh, this is just an example of groundwater aquifer, uh, the typical connection of a, of a well case then going into your pressure pump into your, into your, uh, your basement, if you have a basement, your country home. So sewage, outhouse. So what does the Bible say about that? In Deuteronomy 23, 12 to 25, it tells us, Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad, and thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be that when thou shalt ease thyself, meaning going to the bathroom, thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back the cover which cometh from thee. So we're instructed from the Bible that we're supposed to clean up after ourselves when we go. So we're not supposed to leave a mess. So sanitary practices that we've, we have refined and developed for um, being as close to our bed as possible involve city sewage, septic systems, a drier chemical outhouse, and so we're just going to go over these. We'll start off with a, a septic system, since everybody is probably familiar with a city sewage system. With a septic system, there's some basic uh, steps in a, uh, getting your sewer to, to its final resting place. Uh, you have the main sewer line, which leaves your house, called a waste line. That's shown in number one there. And that basically connects to your home or, homeowner's indoor plumbing system. And it leads to a septic tank. Now, a septic tank is, is usually basically a big box buried in the ground, which has got two compartments for water. And uh, it's usually buried about 10 feet or so away from the house's foundation. And this is where the, all forms of waste, solid and liquid, are, are moved. And they're basically held there for a while. While the solids settle to the bottom of the tank and form a sludge, the floating, a floating scum develops on the top. And if you, if you eat uh, oily foods, a grease layer will be there. Uh, a pl total plant-based diet person that eats very little grease will have a very healthy septic system because uh, grease is more, most difficult to, to digest. So, the, so if you ever heard here, when you look at advice for, for um, uh, frequency at, at cleaning out a septic system, there's differences based off what you put in your septic system. Um, so the clarified liquid is then transferred through to the next tank where a similar uh, settling process happens. And then from that tank, uh, it, that, it, it goes to what's known as a, a leaching system or a, a weeping tile bed. And that system essentially, it's pretty simple. It amounts to pipes with holes in it. So you may be a horizontal plastic pipe or, and little holes in the side and they slowly drip out to the ground. So that's the final resting place. So inside the uh, septic system, I'm trying to capture here that, that uh, you see there's a septic system that it's a, basically a tank under the ground and it's typically stored under the grass so you don't, you don't see it. Uh, and there may be a foot of sand sometimes underneath above that. Uh, and you need to know when you're getting a property, you need to know where this is. It, like you can look in a basement and see where the sewer lines leave the house. And then you generally know about five to 10 feet out, that's where it's going to be. Just, just without, without even having to, to dig a hole in the ground. Um, 
And when you, uh, you need to know where it is, you need to, very importantly, you need to know where the weeping tiles is. Very, very important. So to the leach field, uh, it's, it's, so it goes off to the side there. You need to know where that goes. Um, and I'll get into why. And you also need to know, as we talked about separation distances, now, now is the time we want to consider, now I know where the septic system is, where is my well? Is it, is it far enough? Okay. Uh, and if you're considering purchasing a country property, it is very, very common as a standard purchase um, requirement that before the property is closed, that the septic system is cleaned out. They have to have a pump out before you, before you, uh, you take possession of the property. Because periodically systems are pumped out, and um, you always want to make sure that, that as a part of a purchase agreement, you have it uh, pumped out. And um, current, septics, current, current laws require the minimum, septi uh, the minimum distances to be maintained between the wells. So if it's a relatively newish home, the separation distances are probably fine. Um, and a, a septic tank system can only be installed by a licensed installer. So this is not something that's a do-it-yourself thing. You have to have a licensed installer to install a septic system. So there's a, another layout sort of highlighting the fact that the well is far behind the house on one side of the house, septic systems on the opposite side of the house, typically. And then um, you have your two access tanks and then uh, the, uh, the, leap, the leaching bed. Now, in, if you're building a new property and you're wanting to, to build a home, then you need to concern yourself as where is an appropriate place for a leaching bed. Sometimes you'll visit a property and you'll see there's a house here, and then there's this raised up area where it's sort of level, and it's like a level sort of square field area with nothing growing. And what that typically means is that um, in order to get an adequate leaching bed, they had to build up an area with sand in order to have an adequate leaching bed. And, and what that mean, means is that they had to do a test um, to determine is the, sound, is, this, is the soil capable of absorbing all the sewage. That's known as a soil percolation tex, test. It's pretty simple. It basically means digging a hole in the ground, filling with water, and timing how long it takes for that water to absorb. It's a very, very simple test. Um, and typically that test would be done by a, a septic system contractor. Um, the, you might want to contact your building department, whoever is responsible for the building permits, and so they would let you know where um, or, or how they want that test performed to, because it may be a condition upon getting a building permit that you are able to, to get a septic system there. So if you buy a place in a swamp, for example, the, the water level of that swamp might only be three feet under the floor, uh, under, the, under the soil, and you almost can't get a septic system in there. So, uh, and, you can't get, and because you can't get a septic system in there, you can't get a building permit. So it, there's concerns that you can't just go and get a property anywhere. Um, but but there, there's ways around that. For example, you could build up the, ground, build up the soil and have a septic system higher, which means your house has to be higher, but um, those are all added costs that you need to consider. So the land could be like, you know, 10% of what the other land is, but there's reasons for it. So you have to consider those, those reasons. So I, I, um, I briefly talked a little bit about septic beds. They are fragile. No trucks. So. Um, you might move into a place and, and say, oh, yeah, put the moving truck over there. Well, if over there is where your leach bed is, you might have just smashed up your plastic pipes if you put a huge truck over there. Little riding lawnmowers, that sort of thing, no problem. But if, if you drive heavy equipment over top of a leaching bed system, you're very likely to crack and destroy those pipes, and to repair that will be very, very expensive. So if the homeowner doesn't know where the leaching bed system is, then they can't speak about whether or not it's, it's damaged. Maybe they drove a truck over it. So you really need to know where your leaching bed is. It's very important to know. So I alluded to this earlier, pumping septic tanks. How often do you need to pump a septic tank? Well, if, if, you're, peaking, if you're speaking to the, the person who drives with sometimes, in our, in where, I were going to, where I was living, they were called the honey wagon. They come up with some silly names for these things. And they say, oh, you need to pump it out every, every six months. Or you need to pump it out every year, or, or twice a year, or that they, they will tell you to do it really rapidly, and, and often you'll get some really bad advice that will cost you money. So you need to be cautious, um, uh, trusting someone who's, who's, um, who is in a position to make money off your ignorance. So don't be ignorant. Uh, here's a table here which gives you an idea. So Say, for example, you, have, uh, you need to know the size of your septic tank. You have a 1,000-gallon septic tank, 
and you have two people living in the house. On that table there, it tells you that you should uh, pump out your tank every 5.9 years. Um, so there's some people, say for example, like in our household, um, we have seven people, and I believe it's a 1,500-gallon tank, seven people, 1,500 people, that tells me that we should pump out our tank every two years, 2.1 years. Okay? So it gives, you, it gives you an idea of how often you should pump out your septic system. So uh, one of the things that, when it comes to pumping out a septic system, you can save yourself some money. So knowing where your septic system is um, is important because a septic tank system, um, um, like a, a pump out company may say, we'll come pump out your tank, but you have to have the lids exposed. That's what they'll say. So when they arrive, they expect to see a hole in the ground that you've dug out. Here's an example of someone getting, uh, pumping out a system, and they'll want to have the, the hole exposed. They want to show up, lift the lid, and put, put their pipe in, suck it out, and then drive away, and you, you cover it up afterwards. That'll save you some money. The other thing is, is uh, they can save some money is sometimes um, you can contact your neighbors, and if you can get two or three households together, they might give you a little bit of a break. So you could, you know, save 30 bucks or 20 bucks or something. Say, we've got, th we got three houses here that, that we need a pump out. What, what price will you give me? And you can call around two, different, two or three different companies, and you may get a better price um, for, for getting multiple uh, tanks pumped at the same time. Uh, but I must say this. Um, those are the recommendations. But I have known homeowners that uh, have working septic systems, and they say, we will never pump it out. Ever. And if, as long as you're careful with the septic system, it's possible to have a septic system which bacteriologically, it, it breaks it down, uh, but the solids will eventually build up, but you can almost last a lifetime with a large enough tank. Um, there are products to add to us to your, to your septic tank, like there's that incre in improve the bacteria and, uh, that, are, that are in your well. And of course, if you use lots and lots of bleach, you'll tend to kill the bacteria in your well. So, um, some people I've known have said they, would ne they won't put a drop of bleach down, their, down into their well. I myself have grown up on a well all my life, and my mom used bleach all the time, and we were okay. So um, I tend to have a sort of a balanced view that as long as you're not using like gallons of bleach a month, or well, even a, probably not even a gallon, frankly, going down your well, um, you're, you're, you're probably fine. But um, pumping out your well it is important, but but uh, don't believe a septic tank system operator that tells you you need to pump it out every six months. It's simply not true. <laughs> okay. We're on to dry chemical toilets. So there are times you may find a, uh, a country property that there is either no septic system available or, you, or no, no place where you can install one, or perhaps you can't afford to install a septic system. And uh, you'd like to temporarily live in a place and build while you save up till you can. So uh, a dry or a chemical toilet can be a, a temporary solution or even a long-term solution in some situations. There's just an example of, of ranges of uh, what's known as dry, dry toilets. They are often sold as a composting toilet. So there's a Sunmark composting toilet, 368 bucks. Then there's a compact electric, 1500. Then there's a Coleman large portable flush toilet, which is essentially like these porta potties You fill in with that blue chemical stuff, and then you go dump it out. And then there's larger ones, uh, which is sort of like a whole house uh, one, which is in the range of $2,000. So these are sort of packaged systems. Some of them separate the urine and the fecal content. Um, and, and some of them like this, the, the more expensive one there, at the end you have a very rich uh, compost that can be used in your garden. So there's there are pluses and minuses. Many people sort of think of the idea of handling that and just laugh. I can see people laughing. They're like, no, thank you. Well, and there's other people that they feel like that's the great, this most natural thing they want to do, and it's the best, the best free fertilizer you can get. So um, I, I'm not going to convince you one way or the other. That's, <laughs> it's a personal preference. So these systems, but these systems are way less money when it comes to installing a septic system. So if you are, if what's holding you back from moving to the country is a septic system, uh, then maybe these th systems are, are something that you want to consider. A very, very, very inexpensive method is a dry composting sawdust toilet. 
I mean, it's, a dry composting sawdust toilet is extremely simple. Um, in a tiny house movement, it's sort of a, a, a common way to do things. They are um, so simple, it essentially amounts to a bucket that you put sawdust in over top of a toilet seat. Very, very simple, and you periodically take it out. And, and often, um, like for example, at this camp out here today, we brought along a, what's now called a double duty pail. It's, it's very simple. So basically the only reason that sometimes these systems are used is because you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and you've got to pee. And you don't want to go out to the outhouse. So all these sometimes, the only purpose of the inside houses are just for those moments when you want to take 20 seconds out of bed, get back into bed, and go back to sleep. And the rest of the time, you can wake up and take the walk to the outhouse. So this, this double duty pail, it's something you can get at K and Tire. Um, essentially, they come with these Ziploc bags, which expand out to a garbage bag. And um, they have, like, essentially what amounts to, like, diaper material in there, which absorbs the liquid and holds the smell back. And you fold it back up, goes inside that Ziploc bag, and you just dispose of it. So for a camp out, inside the trailer, um, for those 20-second step-outs, that's what we actually have here today. So if you want to see a double-duty pail, I've got one to show you, but they're not, there's nothing to them. <laughs> um, so, of course, the, the most... If you're, if you're going to build a place in the country, the most common thing to build and the, most, the least expensive is an outhouse. And that can be your, your go-to. Now, when it comes to outhouses that are for long-term practices, a long-term outhouse, they, recommend, they typically recommend having a rather large hole. Uh, for example, in this, in this diagram here, it shows a two-foot uh, square box hole going down four feet deep. So that's, if you're intending to use an outhouse every day, for the next uh, you know, three years or something, you might want it to be uh, a, a big pit. For this camp out, for example, we're, we're planning a, uh, for use for just the people here, the, the holes there are, are not that big. And uh, human waste, the, the biggest volume of waste is frankly urine. And urine just drips into the soil and, and uh, it, it is uh, filtered by the soil through the natural processes. We've maintained many, the proper distances from uh, wells. So, um, for irregular use, or if you just want to move, move your outhouse periodically from spot to spot, a smaller hole is, is, uh, is adequate. But if you're going to have a long-term use, for example, the outhouses that are over here came from a uh, campground, and at the campground they put a hole in like this. Essentially it's a, uh, it's a, a hole with, a, with a, uh, a, a box in there that's lined with plastic to make, make sure that there's no sideways leakage and all the, all the, all the, the drainage of the, of the liquids are down. And so it's a simple box that can be put into the ground. But that's really only for, for um, extensive, long-term, large number of people use. So if, if you're wanting to keep that for a long time in your house, in your home, and rely on something like one of those internal composting toilets for uh, the midnight peas, um, this would be something you'd want to build. And building an outhouse can be kind of fun. There's, there's all kinds of things you can do to make them look, uh, pers personalize them. Um, just, you know, there's all sorts of things building a house. Uh, and, you know, if you spend a little time and you uh, do some searches online, there's all kinds of uh, fun, neat var variations on an outhouse that are, are very, very functional. So on to power, utility, generator backup. So what, what most people do in the city is they, when they think about power, they don't think about water. When you're in the country, when you think about power, you've got to think about water. So Pam and Gord here, uh, they were on utility for quite some time, and every now and then there'd be a wicked storm, and the power would go out. Now in the city, you think the power, oh, power's flickered and gone out. Uh, you're thinking half hour, two hours, maybe four hours tops, and I'll have my power back. Um, I'll have to ask Gavin to pipe up here. How long was your power out for the longest, Gavin? A week? Maybe a week. Um, almost a week. They're out in the boonies. Okay? Out in the sticks. So how's no water for a week? So if you are totally on utility, think power, think water. That's why I have this picture here. So when you're living in the country, your power is your water. So sometimes there are some advantages. They're now on solar water, so if the power goes out, well, that, that right now they're totally off the power. Um, but they transition solely from on-grid on to totally off-grid. So if power goes out, they really don't care. Because all, all that matters is that they have battery or solar power, and, and they've got water. And so it doesn't really affect them. So water is a really important um, item to consider when you're thinking about power in the country. So um, 
probably the biggest thing when it talks about, when we're thinking about power, and we, you know, the Bible tells us that a time will come when no man shall buy unless they have the mark, the mark of the beast. The time that we call no buy, no sell, right? The Bible says no buy, no sell. And so at that time, do you think you're going to be able to buy power from utilities if you don't have the mark of the beast? Okay, so if you don't, I mean, right now we have uh, the systems, we used to sort of think that it was impossible to, to understand how people would be, uh, as it's actually, it's in most visa contracts, proscribed, a proscribed person. If you look at the fine print of your visa contract, you'll find that you cannot be a proscribed person. Well, a proscribed person nowadays is someone who is maybe perhaps supporting something like a terrorist activity. Nowadays, uh, the most, co most common thing in our world is, is the support of the lifestyles which would be sort of captured in Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, if you have any opinions that have expressed um, a biblical understanding of what, uh, of what the, the Lord says about those that practice Sodom and Gomorrah lifestyles, you could find yourself of being a prescribed person. In Canada, it's actually considered hate speech to, 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 uh, to state as yourself that... Uh, homosexual immoral practices are against the Bible. So I'm not stating that as myself, but the Bible says it. And so I can quote the scriptures, and right now in Canada, you're, if you quote in the scriptures, you're okay with that. But if you express it in your own words, in your own ways, it can be considered hate speech. So uh, you could be kind, just well for that particular issue, you can find yourself into a no buy, no sell, because you are now a prescribed person. So you can turn, you can turn yourself into a terrorist, because you are uh, committing hate crimes. A, a, a fundamentalist, because the, the, the Bible has fundamental principles, and you're a fundamentalist. The word fundamentalist has been, it's, it's a good word. The, all the people that founded um, the Constitution of the United States and those that uh, formed lots of Canada were, relied on fundamental principles of morality, good government, honesty, hard work. But um, the word fundamentalist has now become someone who wants to walk into the stores and with, with, with uh, um, bombs on them and blow people up. So no buy, no sell. How will you get water in no buy, no sell? It's a question to ask yourself. So what do you really need when you're considering power? Uh, there are some very basic needs when it comes to, to things such as, uh, as employment. There may be certain powered items you need, such as a laptop or a, a cell phone. Um, but you really need to keep uh, an inventory of what you truly need. And when you're in the city, what you need and what you want, there's a big blur between what you really need and what you want. You really need to know the difference. So one of the things that you can do is take an inventory. You can purchase an item called like a, a kilowatt. There's a, a couple of varieties of them uh, available. And essentially what it amounts to is a, a little gizmo you plug into the wall, and then you plug in your device that you're using. And it'll tell you how much power you use. And I got a picture here of a whole bunch of wall warts. And what most people don't realize is that if you have one of these wall warts plugged into the wall, and you're not using the other gizmo on the other end, you're using power. So that's known as phantom power. So um, for example, this little power bar you see here, it's got a switch on everything. So if you've got a wall wart plugged in, you know, I think many of us have a cell phone, and they've got those little wall wart, that's those little black boxes, that's called the wall wart. Yeah, those little black boxes, you've got it plugged into the wall, and you're ready to plug your cell phone in. Well, while your cell phone's not plugged in, you're using power because that wall wart is generating the proper voltage, and you're actually slowly using power. On a solar system, you care about that. Yeah, thank you. you really care about wall wart power. You don't, you don't really, when you're on the grid, you really don't care. But when you're on a solar system, you care about that. that. That's important to consider. So you need to think about that. And as you take an inventory of what you need, the, the best way to save you money is to, to stop, is to reduce your use. Because the more you intend on using, the larger the system. If you're considering solar or an off-grid system or a generator, the more you use, the larger your system has to be to handle that use. The less you use, the smaller you can get away with. So when you're considering, um, when you're considering power, I'm going to briefly touch on um, some of the thoughts for power. Uh, so batteries here, we're going to probably get a little bit more into the details of the battery. I'm not going to get into that here. But there's some details that are important when you're considering building a home. Um, batteries are uh, large, heavy, and uh, you, you see here there are some batteries in a box. They're in a box because they produce uh, hydrogen, which is explosive, and, and they need venting. Properly vented, they're totally safe. Okay, so, so the considerations when it comes to country living, um, if, and if you're going to go with the solar system, 
uh, and you're going to build a place, can I get a really heavy battery to a place where I want to store it, which is close to my power, and c can it be vented? So most people don't plan a room for batteries or space to get there. And most often, if you get into your furnace room, you've got this tiny, weeny little door to get there. And sometimes you have to go in sideways. <laughs> That's not going to work if, if you want to get a big battery in there. So, so for planning purposes, you need to plan differently if you're going to plan to build and use solar. Make sure you can get something heavy there. Um, make sure you can vent it. So typically, the, the easiest way to vent is to go on against an outside wall. So you've got a space dedicated for an outside wall to put venting for your battery. So those are some overall overreaching considerations uh, for battering. OK, so now what, what if you have no sun? Next consideration is um, generating power. So with power, typically you want to have uh, if a generator, which could be used if you have a, a, a solar system. To, when you've got no sun, you need to give an extra little boost to your batteries to charge them up maintaining your battery power. So from a practical pro standpoint, when you're um, looking at building a property, where physically is your power going to be? And when we're talking about power, I've got examples here of propane, diesel, and gas generators on this screen. You need to know where's the generator going to be? Where's the fuel going to be? How am I going to manage that fuel? Because uh, gas tends to uh, form uh, lacquers in them, and you can't store gas infinitely. You have to use it regularly or put fuel stabilizers in there. You have to manage that. The same, same is true for, with fuel issues for, for diesel. So you need to have a plan as to where am I going to store the fuel and how am I going to connect it to my power system. So when you put that power distribution panel on your house, if that's what you're planning, you need to have, uh, and it's going to be solar, you need to have the location for the battery in mind, location for the generator in mind, location for the fuel in mind. So you got to keep all those things interconnected. Um, and you might want to, if you some people have a power house where the power is located at a separate house. That's a, a, way to, a way you can do it. Um, some people just have the generator outside, which is another way you can do it. So you can, you can look at these details. These are basically questions you need to ask so you form good plans when you're building. Okay. Property. So Isaiah 30, verse 21, and thine ear shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. When we're looking for property, we're looking for guidance from the Lord. You need to ask the Lord to guide you. There's no person here who's moved to the country that can tell you where to move, how to move, when to move. It's between you and the Lord. Uh, if you lean on the hand of man, you're leaning on a weak hand. <laughs> lean on the Lord. He will tell you where, when, how to move. In Judges 18, verse 5, it says, And they said unto him, Ask counsel, we pray thee of God, that we may know whether... Our way, which we go, shall be prosperous. So we're, we're instructed in the scriptures to ask the Lord for guidance. What shall we do? So lay of the land. One of the first things people do is when they look for properties, the number one thing that typically comes up is uh, price. And so they'll go on the MLS and they'll look for price, and they'll find the cheapest land, and it'll be, oh, great price. I get 100 acres, and it's only $30,000. And then you go there, and it's, you can get no permit on it. You can have no, it's hunt, no hunting. It's a swamp land for sale. So price is not the only concern going to get a property. You have to be able to build and live on it. So there's, there's a, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's something that you need to consider. Um, the first one on the list there is contamination. I gave you that illustration of asbestos in the well as an example. Um, being on mine site, you need to consider contamination in the area. Um, Landfill site. Are there landfill sites that are close proximity to where, you, where your properties you're considering? That's, that could be a, one of the reasons why a property is very inexpensive, because literally 500 feet from your property is, is the local landfill site. Um, I've seen that before. Uh, another thing to be aware of is seasonal streams and water level changes. Sometimes in the year, when there's great amounts of water, uh, water flow, the water can go up and down, like quite a bit. And so the, where, the area that is actually usable for both a home and a septic system becomes limited by that, by that uh, rise and fall in water. And this, um, Sister White in the Spirit of Prophecy advises us not to live near a swamp. Because in a swamp, when you're near a swamp, you've got all kinds of issues in terms of, uh, of more, more uh, bacteria, more mosquitoes. There's, there are health issues. That's not to say that having a pond is, an, is a problem. But uh, 
they may require some maintenance or some digging out to make that pond uh, healthy or safe, or safe, or to have to make sure that you have flowing water. Flowing water is great, but it also needs to make sure that it's not um, rising to the point where where you plan to build is is compromised by the level of water change. So uh, power and fuel. If you're looking at a property, if you're considering on grid, or even if you're considering off grid, can I get my power and my fuel there? There are some proper, some companies that deliver fuel, if you're thinking of having fuel delivered, that won't drive down an unassumed road. So you have to make sure that, that, you, that you're able to get what you want delivered there. Many places will, but you have to make sure that, that you can find where you're considering what you want delivered to your home if that's what you need, uh, something delivered, or, to, that you, or a plan on how you get it there yourself. Uh, well water depth. Uh, one of the ways, if, if you're looking for new construction, one of the ways to determine the water table, table I mentioned before, ask the local neighbors. Do you know how deep your well is? Knock on a few doors. How deep is your well? Do you have any water issues? Um, do, you have to, do you have to filter your well? That sometimes neighbors are quite friendly and helpful if you're looking at a property to, to buy, and they'll let you know, oh yeah, my well is 75 feet, or oh yeah, we've got to filter our well. It's all, it's all bad water around here. Um, so they can let you know issues that, that you can plan for. That's not necessarily a, a killer to a deal to buy a property, but it, it helps you budget that you know um, what you need to, to make your water okay or what you need to, to drill if you have to drill. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, a septic site. We talked about some of the, reasons, some of the things that are important for a septic site. You need to consider a, a, both a septic site and your well. And if you're buying a new place, it's important that you get a building inspection done. A uh, building inspection can expose some things that you're not aware of, such as cracks in the foundation. There's, there's a whole list of items that a building inspector will, will, will look for. They range from about $300 to $500 or in that kind of range to get a building inspection done. And uh, if, if it tells you about major problems on a home, it's well worth the money that you can, you know, to, to save you from getting into a home where there's uh, major expenses. Or maybe it'll just let you know, for example, that this particular part of the home needs a bunch of work, and you can go back and say, well, we still like your property, but now we know we need to spend 15000 on that so we can, we can have some room to negotiate on your price. So there, there's, it's, there's all sorts of advantages to getting a, a building home inspected. So uh, heat, we're going to talk, I'm only going to briefly touch on this because we're talking about heat uh, later. So heating and cooking. For total independence, wood heat is probably the, the, the single most best source of heat. Wood heat, uh, and it, you know it's said that the wood can heat you multiple times and keep you healthy. It, it, it'll heat you once when you cut the tree down into, and into logs. It'll heat you again when you split it into firewood, and it'll heat you when you move that wood around into your woodshed, and when you move it from the woodshed to your home, and finally it'll heat you when you burn it. <laughs> uh, so as a primary source of heat, wood is great. Uh, if you plan, however, to leave your home in the winter you need to figure out what you're going to do because um, either your home has to be prepared to freeze, meaning that you need to possibly drain water pipes, or you need to have a secondary source of heat. When it comes to insurance issues, if you're considering getting your home insured, um, insurers would want to see designated a, uh, a form of heat which is automatic. So in other words, you're, you're officially, from insurance purposes, your, formal, uh, your, your permanent steady form of heat might be propane. You have a propane heater against the wall, for example. And you never turn it on because you're home and you feed with wood. But if you go, you use the pro propane heat. But from an insurance perspective, they want to know that, that your home is safe when you're stuck in town for five days so that you're not, um, your not home's not getting flooded. So they, want to, they don't want an insurance claim because you, you can't protect your home from heat. So for, we'll just cover some technical information about uh, wood cook stoves. But Yes, question? The government is I'm sorry? The government is well, there's, 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 there are, there's been talk about bans of wood source heating, and, and that's part of the reason why on this page here, there's a wood cook stove. Wood cook stoves in the United States have been banned from EPA, have been excluded, sorry, from EPA regulations. Because it's, it's not only is it your heat, but your cooking. So there's kind of a loophole there, and, and typically the, 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 the bans that you're discussing about are talking about new construction. So we, ha we have grandfathered clauses. So once you have a place that's got a wood cook stove in it, or a wood, or a wood stove, you're, you are typically grandfathered. So it is a, it is a good point, but when you, when you heat with a wood cook stove, um, at least to date, 
uh, it, they are excluded from EPA regulations in the United States, and I believe the same in Canada. Yes. So, um, so, it, so if, in, if independence is your goal, uh, it is good to have a property where you have access to firewood on your property. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are relying on that firewood day to day. Like, say, for example, uh, we understand that the, that the, 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 the time of the end where there is to be persecution of God's people is going to be a relatively short space. Um, it may be a year or two. I, I'm not putting any dates or times on it. What I'm getting at is that if I have a property that's got a smaller acreage, if I have enough trees on there to burn to see me through a period of time, then I may get to the point of the time of trouble before I have to flee that can at least see me through a window of space of time. But it's typically recommended to have about five acres of wood and you're independent complete entirely. If you have five acres of woods, you're completely independent um, in a sustainable way, meaning you can cut down deadfall and keep, and keep uh, if you've got five acres of forest. Um, so that can be total independence. So we'll cover some of that in wood management, so I'm, I'm not going to get into the details of that. One of the basic details in terms of planning the arrangement of your house is storage of wood. On this slide here, I've got three different locations, three different slides there. One is showing sort of a, a, a small stack of firewood in the home. You typically want to have a small little, a small location for wood in the home. And it's got some wood outside. And I got a picture of some bugs in wood. So in the winter, normally you've got no worries about mosquitoes and moths because they're outside, they froze, and you're like, no bugs. But in our home, we'll bring in some little stack of firewood like that, and we'll see some mosquitoes in the house. And a couple of moths will come. Now, what that, what that should tell you is that, one, you can expect that when a small batch, you can probably manage that. But long term, it is not advisable to have large quantities of firewood stored in your house, unless you want to, unless you want to deal with the bugs issues. So, and the other thing that, that I guess on the, on the, the, uh, the insect thing is, is um, <clears throat> if your wood is cut, clean, fresh, and dry, uh, and the, the, the outside is relatively, uh, shall we say, uninfested of bugs, then you have less issues with, with uh, bugs. The longer the logs have been lying down on the ground, the more chance of having infestation in those bugs. But for example, just to give you a number, um, in a, in a fuel-efficient home, which, which we used to live in, uh, we would manage uh, about four and a half bush cord of wood. Now, a bush cord, which you typically right now sells for in the range of 250 to 350, depending on where. In Toronto, probably even up to 400. Um, and a bush cord is uh, four foot by four foot by eight foot. Typically, they come in three stack lengths of wood. So a, some people call a face cord of wood, which is is uh, basically uh, um, four, four foot by 16 by, by uh, eight foot. But it's not considered a legal measurement. But um, So three of those make up a, a bush cord. So typically, we would burn about five bush cord. It would be really unwise to put five bush cord of wood in your basement. It's a large, but, but I know people who have put that amount of wood in their basement. And it's not a good practice. <clears throat> not wise. So that's, that's the main point here. You need to plan for outside storage. And when it comes to outside storage of wood energy, the next item you need to consider as well, if, you're, if you have a oil um, heat, whether it be fuel oil, where is your fuel oil going to be? If you're purchasing an existing home, if you sell something like this, um, you'd, I would immediately know, just glancing at this picture, that that tank is no good. There are regulations in Ontario which require you to replace a tank at certain frequencies. So um, this tank is, is rusty, a tank that's externally rusty. There, it's, the tank is probably actually maybe functionally fine, but the regulations won't allow you to use it. And an oil, oil, oil company won't fill it up for you. To, that'll come to your door because it has to have a certification on it. So if you see a home, that's another thing is sometimes people will have a tank like this stored in the basement. And then they'll go from homeowner to homeowner and then someone's going to frame in some of these beautiful nice walls and a wonderful bathroom and that tank is in a room there and there's no way the tank is coming out. But every, I think it's, I can't remember the, the rate, it's something like five years. I think it's five or eight years. I don't know the number off the top of my head. It's something like that. Every, whatever that period is, you have to replace your tank. 20 years. 20 years. Okay, I got a number. Every 20 years. So when you buy a home, it's likely been there for 10 years. So you may have 10 years. And maybe it's been there for 15 years. So you got five years and you got to replace that tank. 
So if there's this beautiful bathroom in the basement you love, and then there's a tiny little door to that tank, know that that tank is going to be garbage in five years, and you have to replace it. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, it's really important that you know that where you're going to store your fuel. It's not that it's a big deal to have fuel stored outside, but, but um, just, be, just be aware of that. They have to keep that in mind. So food security, another, another item for, for living in the country, and it's, this is sort of um, the cart before the horse, because Sister Phyllis is going to talk about growing food and getting it to, to the place where you can store it. But uh, it's, it's not much use to have a whole bunch of food grown in your garden if you have no way to keep it and to store it and to make it last you throughout the year. So you need to think about how are you going to store your food. So food security is, is basically what, what I'm talking about is preserving the harvest. Now, food security does not, and I want to clear, clear this, is, does not mean going out and buying two years' supply of canned food and storing it in your house. That's not food security. Food security is, is what I'm talking about, is independence, that you're able to, to grow your food, uh, and the food you grow you can use over the next, the next year. It doesn't necessarily mean having, having um, gobs of food stored in your, in your basement that you've bought at Costco. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. So uh, how do you store food? In Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So another aspect of country living that's important is the Lord has made us to be gardeners. He wants us to garden. And, and uh, uh, that's one of the things that we, that we need to do to dwell our, get our, our connection with the Lord. Isaiah 33, 16, He shall dwell in the high places, his rocks, so his place, shall be the, shall be, his place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks. Bread shall be given, and his water shall be sure. So in, on the subject of food security, Ellen White writes in the book Adventist Home, page 141, Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. That's the phrase I'm focusing on here. For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a serious one. We should now begin to heed the instruction given to us over and over again. Get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you'll be free from interference of our enemies. So the term there, raising provisions, if you never can and preserved, provisions basically refers to growing your food and preserving it. Canned goods, depending on what you can, can last for a couple years. Typically, you, you trying to use up most of your canned goods in the year you preserve it, but you can sometimes get two years out of it and stretch. You can have peaches for a couple years. So provisions is a reference to you storing your and canning your own food. So it, that's, it's not talking about uh, getting a pallet worth of food from Costco and putting it in your basement. That's not what it means. So food security involves some, some method of storing food. Setting up a simple roof, root cellar is quite easy to do. Here's another item to think about in your basement. It involves es essentially um, having ventilation and having a uh, uninsulated against the outside area in the house that can keep it relatively cool. Essentially, it's a free refrigerator if you have uh, the right ground temperature. You know, for generations, people have, have uh, set up root cellars as a primary mean of food storage with no other refrigeration. That was the only source of refrigeration. My, my wife will say that for her, for grandma in the well, she would put, put the milk down the well, and that's, that was it. That was the source of keeping the milk cool. Uh, so you can set one in your, in your basement, but traditionally a small outbuilding is the best way to have a root cellar outside, but it's certainly much more convenient to go down to your basement. But before you visit, build one, I highly recommend that you visit existing outhouses. Oh, no, existing root cellars, sorry. <laughs> too many subjects in my mind. <laughs> You might want to, on the outhouse, do that too. <laughs> but but um, uh, you build, visit one. There's, there's little features that are different in each one. Um, the areas for, for hanging your food, uh, they are traditionally an outhouse in, a, in an out, outer building, not inside the home. But you, uh, there's aspects of storing things with soil that you can st and in wooden boxes. Um, there's little books you can get there. There's one building an underground root cellar. There's all sorts of, of, of uh, books available. That one's by uh, Phyllis Hobson. There's, there's lots of resources on building these and a whole bunch of uh, varieties. It's, it's, it's wise to get good advice. Uh, one of the basic principles that's shown in this slide here is cold air in at one location, warm air out, and good ventilation around the stuff that's stored. That's a, a basic principle that needs to be considered when you're building uh, a root cellar. Um, there's a little bit more detail here. It shows an example uh, built into the earth. It's got a cold air 
uh, in at the bottom. The pipe actually extends inside the house, sucks it in from the top, uh, and then a warm, air, warm one out, and it's got an, a location for you to control the amount of air that goes in and out, so that if you have like, if you suddenly get hit by the really cold weather, you're not going to have uh, unnecessarily cooling. They've actually commercialized these things to the point where they're really expensive, and the Swedish do stuff like that. There's an example of a, of a underground storage. I would never recommend buying one of those. I mean, unless you somehow have uh, have unlimited wealth, but that's sort of uh, they, they actually sell this item as, a, as an underground fridge, but you don't need to have that level of, uh, of item. You can build it very simply and inexpensively. That's not something I'd, I'd recommend anyone buy. Um, when it comes to preserving, preserving roots, root vegetables, like for example, there's carrots shown here. They're stored in a box, layered in sand to keep them moist. You can do it inside in a box, which is handy and convenient. You can also do it outside, in a, digging a big hole there. This has got an example where it's covered in straw. Uh, you can do that way in, in a variety of ways. Here's an example of, of apples, but there's a real serious flaw with this particular figure here. And the serious flaw is, is consider where's water going? Where's the water going to go when it melts? It's going to go down, and if that's like a garbage can that's watertight. Where's the water going to go? It's going to get into that, into that bucket, and everything in there is going to spoil. So, when you, when you, so the, the basic principle of how this goes together in terms of layer is good, but you need to have it tapered so that your water does not fill that. We've had someone in our church who had this exact issue, where it's something like this exactly was built, and it filled with water, and everything spoiled. So you can do methods where they're fully buried. Here's an example, half buried, where it's covered in straw, and there's some soil covered up and a board to access it. So that's another method of storing um, uh, items for a longer period of time. And now also you can do it totally above ground where there's, uh, you can see here it's got drainage handled as well, and a layer of soil and straw, and then you've got your root crops under there. You can put a couple of bushels in a little mounds, and when you're ready to go, you don't go to, don't, don't go to Costco to get your potatoes and your carrots and your, and your beets, but you could just go to a mound, dig in, and you got yourself, you got yourself um, a fresh supply of food, totally independent of, of the grocery store. So, there's a website I'd recommend you go check out. Root Cellars, 101 Root Cellar Designs, Use and Mistakes to Avoid. Um, it's really good to learn from mistakes of others. So I've got I to gotta cut my time here short here. I've got uh, just a few more slides. Let me just read here. Food security, preserving the harvest, it is not for the time of trouble. The Lord has shown me repeatedly that it's contrary to the Bible and to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints had food laid up by them or in the field in the time of trouble, when the sword or famine and pestilence are in the land, it would be taken from them by violent hands, and strangers would reap their fields. It will be, then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God, and he will sustain us. Our bread and water will be sure and at, at that time, and we shall not lack or suffer hunger. For God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness if necessary. He will send ravens to feed us, as he did feed Elijah, to rain manna from heaven, as he did the Israelites. So the, the purpose of food, we are to rely on the Lord. And very quickly, I'll touch on income. You need to think about how will you earn an income when you're in the country. You need to support yourself. So the, your support could be the same job you're doing now, perhaps telecommuting. Uh, there's a lot of service industries that we can do. Uh, to serving other people. Right now is the retirement time for the baby boomers. There's lots of support that baby boomers need in the country. Um, and I, I just briefly touch on when, when we do... When we switch from working for an employer to working for somebody else, just make sure that whenever we work with individuals, we practice complete, total honesty. Remember, our purpose as Christians in this world are to represent God's character to the world. We are to be completely honest. So as we deal with men and people around us, never ever allow uh, the thought of potentially taking advantage of someone to enter your mind. Always be completely honest. Remember, we're living before the Lord. We're in the, the final events of this earth's history. And making a couple extra bucks off someone because you're, because you're going you're gonna to charge them more than you said you would, be honest, be clear, be forthright, and, and the Lord will prosper your hand. Without counsel, the purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of many, the counsels are established. It is wise for you to consider how you'll work, ask advice for others, you could work from home. You can search for paper jobs in the area we're considering moving. You may start with your existing skills, but you may need to consider jobs with new skills. 
And I would advise that you avoid multi-level marketing jobs and pyramid businesses. There's lots of people around that are trying to get you involved in these items and they'll promise you all kinds of income. It's, uh, it is frankly unwise to get in involved in multi-level marketing. It, there may be great products, you may want to use their products, but I wouldn't rely on it on a, on a, as an income. And I would highly recommend that you plan your spending based on income experience. Don't think that you're going to earn lots of money and spend based off what you think you're going to earn. Like for, just as a brief example, I had a lady suggest that she was going to start an organic farm in the country and she was going to rely on that for income to, to support herself. It is not wise to start a new business venture that you have no experience in and rely, rely on that for income. Uh, use counsel, go, move guardedly, move, move with thought, thoughtful process as you think about how you're going to support yourself and seek counsel of others. So we, we've tried to cover all these topics here, and as I said, they are, it's very introductory. So it's, it's um, only really there that the, the subject matter is to put questions in your mind so that you're ready to, to answer the question when you move forward. We are to follow where God's providence opens the way, and as we advance, we shall find that heaven has moved before us, enlarging the field for labor far beyond the proportion of our means and ability to supply. The great want of the fields open before us should, and they should appeal to all to whom God has entrusted talents of means or ability, that they may devote themselves and their all their all of God, all their, and their all to God. The field of work and the light of truth is to go to all the dark places of the earth, in a much shorter time than many think possible. So I want you to always keep in mind that one of the reasons that you're in the country is to share the gospel with your neighbors. We're not there just to to, to eat bread and have shelter. We're there to share the good news of salvation. The Lord will work through those who will open the scriptures to these people who have made their homes in these retired places of the country. And I appeal to my brethren and sisters to unite in doing this good work and to carry it forward to completion. And remember, as we consider anything in moving to the country, you, you ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. So don't run out and make unadvised decisions in moving to the country. Be thoughtful, be careful, and plan. Ask questions. Pray. Pray. Shall we close with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings of uh, the country, the blessings of your guidance, of the Spirit, Lord, that you've given us to remind us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Lord, may we be convicted of the sin that remains in our heart. Lord, purge us with the blood of Jesus that we may walk in the way you want us to. And Lord, may we be both prepared for the judgment to come, and Lord, may we Lift up Jesus to the, to the world, to our neighbors, that they also may be ready for your soon coming, that we may all look up and say, this is our God whom we've waited. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.